Welcome to the 23rd episode of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today, our guest graduated from ASIJ in 2005. She then attended BYU, and during her time there, she spent two years on a missionary trip to Hokkaido. She then would go on to graduate with a Bachelor's of Science and Family Studies with a focus in human development. She has always been passionate about cognitive, physical, mental, and emotional development of human beings and how relationships, such as parent to child or husband to wife, can affect these components. Upon graduating from BYU, she worked for the BYU University Extension, where she was in charge of training teachers and developing curriculum for many missionaries who are traveling to 50 plus countries around the world. She currently resides in New York with husband Darren, who's also an ASIJ graduate, and her three children with a fourth on the way. She is a full-time mom and also a music teacher from home and coaching mothers around the world. Welcome to the podcast, Erica. Thanks, Nikki. It's good to be here. Nice to see you. So you are coming in from New York City. Mm-hmm. And... Well, currently we escaped New York City, but yeah, we're kind of global nomads right now. We're just wherever we can stay, but with COVID. But Let's start off with human development. This is quite mm-hmm. a unique major. And uh, off air, we were talking about how it's a Bachelor's of Science. So, mm-hmm. you know, what got you into studying human development what exactly does it entail so i mean kind of long story i don't know if i mean hopefully people can relate i just didn't know what i wanted to study when i went to college and so i jumped around a lot i really enjoyed math so i thought maybe i'd want to be doing something with math but then realized that i enjoy math but i don't necessarily enjoy maybe teaching math so i jumped to asian studies because i had a lot of credits in japanese already having been able to speak it and took some tests to test out of classes but um, it was actually after, so I settled on exercise science and I was doing like the um, physiology, exercise science. I kind of wanted to go into fitness and things like that. And I went on this mission trip for a year and a half. And while I was out there, I worked with a lot of families and I always have loved little kids and um, just interacting with them. And I felt like it was a, a strength of mine to be able to, maybe because I'm the oldest, so I had younger siblings growing up, but I just felt like working with children was a strength of mine. And so when I got back from my mission, I just thought, okay, what do I want to do? It's kind of too late for elementary education because you have to kind of take all these different prereqs in a different form than the prereqs that I had already taken. And so I kind of looked into some other majors and found human development. And human development is not solely child development, but it's from birth to death, the lifespan. And you can kind of choose which classes you take to kind of create your own emphasis. So I did do mostly child development, but I did did take one adult aging and development class, which actually helped me in a future job that I had, um, as well as adolescent development, um, child development, and then even um, like babies in utero and that sort of development. And within that development, like you said, there's cognitive, emotional, moral, um, physical, lots of different things. And it was something that just intrigued me because it's, I've always been interested in psychology, but it's kind of psychology involving also the environment that that individual is in. And so um, most people who do major in this particular major usually go on to do um, family therapy. Um, There's a lot of therapists in there, um, marriage counselors, things like that. A lot of them, if they just have a bachelor's, will go into early childhood education, or you can even go into education as well. But that's kind of what human development is. It's kind of, you know, a word where you hear it and you're like, what the heck is human development? But basically, it's just the science of people and their environment and how that all plays together, nature and nurture, kind of how it all plays together to create an individual and why people act the way they do and why they develop the way they do based off of that. So. Yeah, so, so you mentioned, um, you know, you went on a, this two-year mission, mm-hmm. BYU, a uh, Mormon school, so very different, obviously, from most other schools. Is that uh, a requirement for students who attend BYU? No, it's not at all. Actually, it's, it's related to the church. BYU is also a church school, but they're completely separate. There's just a lot of people that do choose to go on these mission trips, and it was something from when I was a young age that I wanted to to do. Yeah. So when I was 21, I just put in the papers and said, let's go and ended up in Hokkaido, which was actually really great because my Japanese, I've always been able to communicate in Japanese, but that definitely helped bring my Japanese to a um, higher level as far as communicating. And- I know we were going to talk about language later on, but while we're on that topic, I know you, you spoke some Japanese when you were at SIJ. 
how did you learn Japanese when you were in the States? So I actually lived in Japan till I was six. I was born and we moved there when I was about two weeks old. Bless my mom that she got on an airplane with a two week old <laughs> <laughs> and flew to Japan. Um, but I actually lived there till I was six and I went to Yotian, a Japanese preschool. Um, and then my parents were like, dang, this girl is not speaking any English. We need to get her into an international school because we plan to head back to the U S in a few years and she can't speak any English. So I actually, my first language was probably Japanese as far as in order of what I learned it. So after a few months of Yochi and they put me in a school called Santa Maria, it's over I think a lot of kids who go to CAJ, but, um, but yeah, so I went to that school for about two years and then we moved back to the States when I was going into first grade, going into first grade, I spoke some English cause I did go to that international school, but it was very weak. And I, um, and so I think my mom decided she wanted to speak to us in English to kind of help support us to do what better in school. I remember that first year struggling and people pointing out that I spoke differently and <laughs> it was a little bit of a struggle adjusting. Um, but then we were there through elementary school, middle school. And then, like you said, when I was a teenager, I came back for high school. So when we were in the States, we moved a couple of times and there were a few times where there was one time we lived in Oregon and there's a quite a large Japanese community there. And they would do like evening school once a week where we would get together and read and do math and everything. And, in Japanese. And so that helped keep it up a little bit. And then otherwise, it was just, you know, if my mom would say something in Japanese, or if we would talk to our relatives, or, or if they came to visit or things like that. So my Japanese was pretty rough when we moved to Japan when I was 14, because my mom just chose not to, to speak it in the home very much. But once we got back to Japan, I studied it, it helped a little bit, graduated, and then did this mission trip. I also took Japanese classes all through my freshman and sophomore year at at BYU as well. And they have a great language program at BYU. Almost every language is, re is taught really well there just because of their, there's so many people who go on these mission trips that have a foundation in the language. And um, so it's actually really a great place to learn a language. So that's interesting. Now, you were in Japan and then the US and then Japan. But like, you know, when people just stay in one country, I always wonder, like, but often they will just sort of like forego uh, a language as you said in your case actually your, your mother wasn't speaking too much Japanese in the household mm -hmm. you when you see other families in the U.S. who are mixed or even just like both have or, you know Japanese parents but they're living in the states do you sometimes feel like people have to kind of choose to focus on one in order to you know succeed in in one language because you know mastering both languages is, is very difficult definitely well I mean I felt that way growing up just as a side note before i get to the rest of your question but i remember feeling like until i was in college i didn't quite feel like i could express myself fully in either language you know i kind of felt like i wasn't perfect in english and i wasn't perfect in japanese and i kind of felt this one i think a lot of bilingual children feel that way and so i it is hard and i think that's kind of maybe a trade-off that you have when you do want someone to be bilingual. But as I have, that was one thing that I had a lot of interest in in my studies. And since we had a lot of flexibility in my major to kind of study the research articles that we were interested in as far within, within human development, I did a lot of study on bilingual teaching and learning and in children. And the biggest thing is consistency. And you don't necessarily have to choose one or the other, but you have to be consistent in the level that you're speaking in in one or the other or both right and the other thing that was huge that i pulled from that research was also that it's also up to the individual like if the child decides they don't want to speak it they won't you know and they might they i mean hearing it will always be beneficial there's no there's no loss at that but but if they choose that you know they, their friends all speak english and they want to speak english they'll speak english and and we saw people in our school where their parents spoke to them in japanese and they could understand japanese perfectly but they they weren't very confident in speaking it, you know? And so um, that was really interesting. And children do often choose to speak what their peers are speaking um, more than what their parents are speaking to them. Even for us as parents, I've, you know, my children were born and I said, I'm going to speak only Japanese to them because I don't know when we're going to be in Japan, but I want them to have that exposure. And Darren, my husband also speaks Japanese fluently. We both, you know, he, he can understand what I'm saying. I think that's often a problem when one spouse doesn't know what the other one's saying. It's very easy to just speak the language that you both can speak. But since he understands, I was like, okay, I'm going to do 
you know, 90%, 100% Japanese, I'll be the Japanese parent. But man, it takes a lot of discipline. And when you're in an area that's very homogenous, <laughs> like everyone speaks English, it's hard because people look at you and they're like, oh, what is she speaking, you know? And so being in areas where there weren't a lot of other international languages being spoken, it was really difficult. And I kind of failed a little bit. But when we moved to New York City, everyone and their dog speaks a different language. And so that was a time where I was able to kind of say, okay, I'm buckling down again. There's no excuse if I'm hearing Russian and German and Chinese or whatever on the playground. Like there's no excuse for me to not be speaking, you know, my Japanese to my children. And so, um, so, you know, New York has helped a lot with that, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to, I props to parents who really successfully did it because it is not an easy endeavor. Yeah. That's intriguing that the, the surroundings just, there's so many confounding factors, right? Is that it's the city, then their friends, maybe their girlfriend ends up being like someone from a different country and now they want to learn that language. There's just so many, so many factors, but yeah, I feel like we're, we're living through sort of an experiment right now because as I was saying earlier, there's just so many more mixed marriages than mm -hmm. you know 20 years ago and there will continue to be more mixed marriages and international marriages so I, I'm, I'm always intrigued when i talk to people who you know say well I'm, i try to speak uh, the reverse here right so if someone is you know uh, there's an english speaker and a japanese speaker usually the english speaking parent goes well i try to speak english as much as i can to my child but then i always wonder well to what level can you really get to even if, if you go home and you're talking english you know to mom or dad every day what, where's the limit? And I, I don't know. It seems, it seems right. to be a broad. So in your case, you've got three boys, mm -hmm. fourth on the way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, you've, you've, you've coached a lot of moms about basically being a mom. I mean, what are the most common questions and queries that come to you about kids in general? A lot about tantrums, <laughs> how, to, how to get them to comply without, um, I feel like tantrums are a common one that people will say, my son, you know, every time we're out and I say this, they they have tantrums or whatever. I feel like I, I personally lean. So there's obviously lots of different parenting styles and books and, you know, everything, literature you can read. But I have just found positive parenting. I found that positive parenting or another word to describe a similar type of parenting is uh, respectful parenting has been something that I try and teach on the different platforms that I have. Um, that basically looks like just respecting that your child has emotions, right? We often have this mindset of like, I'm the adult, you're the child, you're submissive to me, but we have to recognize that these are human beings and teaching is best taught by modeling more than by just lecturing, right? Just word vomiting on our children. And so I have found that if we teach our children, if we show our children that we respect their emotions, they will learn to be empathetic human beings in the future rather than I said the, so I don't care what you have to say. This is what mom said, go do it, you know? And so I have found that that is what I try and teach to through my platforms is how can we better help our children feel validated in their feelings? Because emotions and feelings are real things that we humans feel. Right. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of lack empathy sometimes for people because we weren't necessarily maybe taught it. And so it's hard for us to understand maybe why someone feels a certain way, but if we can practice that with our children, they become mirrors of us, the good and the bad. And so I've definitely seen times where my kids will say something. I'm like, Ooh, that came out of my mouth first. <laughs> you know, and they learn that from me. And so with tantrums, especially there's, there's also developmental brain development that's happening there and children under six, five, they, there's left brain and the right brain, right? Left brain is logical. You think, well, this makes no sense. Why would you be screaming about this? The right brain is very emotional. And children's left brain is not as developed as their right brain. And so they'll often have a tantrum because they're, they're here on their emotional side. And for you to logic with them when they're on their emotional side is just, it's, there's no, you're not getting anywhere, right? It's like telling somebody who's sobbing like, well, but this makes no sense why you're crying. You know, you shouldn't be sad. Like, you know, this guy broke up with you. He's a jerk, whatever. It's so much easier to connect if you can connect on that emotional level and then guide them, scaffold them to the logic side. But you have to connect with them emotionally first. And so with tantrums, you know, someone might be crying and we're thinking, this is so unacceptable. But if you're in a place where you can take the time, right? Sometimes you're in a store and you just gotta get them out. But if you're in a place where you can take the time to sit down, 
and give them a hug and say, it is frustrating that we can't eat candy before dinner that, Mm -hmm. you know, and help them understand that I see how you're feeling and I understand where you're coming from. It's not that you're giving in, but you're acknowledging those feelings. Then they can kind of calm down and say, okay, I'm being heard. And so now they're there to ready, ready to kind of compromise with you a little bit. And obviously when they're two, they might not compromise as much, but at least they can feel seen and heard. And I think that most people, including adults, want to be seen and heard and understood from where they're coming from. And so that's probably the biggest question I get is like, how do I help with these tantrums? And that's often like the answer that I give. So I have no children myself, but like a question I have that I often see on Facebook and I'm always kind of thinking like, what's going on here is I see my friends post things like, um, my child does not eat their food. What do I do? And I always wonder like, well, when I was a kid, that was not an issue because we didn't have a choice. So I was wondering, do you ever get questions like that? And if so, what, what are your answers like? Yeah. And you know, it's, it's hard to say because some kids, some kids really are super picky. And I know a lot of parents that are like, I just feed my kid chicken nuggets every day. And, um, but there are a lot of dietitians on Instagram and stuff who will say, just keep exposing your child. Uh, it takes sometimes up to 20 times of exposure before they actually are willing to eat and, or try whatever you give them. And there are phases where kids will eat something really well. A lot of my kids were really good with meats and vegetables early on, and then they hit two. And I would like to think it's probably not a, like a like or dislike, but more of this autonomy that they want to be able to exert their power and their choice and their ability to choose. And so that's also something that I think is really important in teaching children is that you give them choice, right? So for my kids, for example, I want them to eat a, eat a vegetable every meal that we have. And so I give them a choice of carrots or broccoli or cucumber, right? And they can choose one of those vegetables to eat at that meal. And I think just even allowing some sort of a choice gives that ownership to the children and you'll see that they'll own their choices. And so I think that's a huge thing. Again, it's not one size fits all. I think some kids are just really, really finicky, but exposing your children to lots of different things from when they're really young and then continuing to expose them to different foods, I think is a huge thing. And then also using a common theme in positive parenting is that you allow natural consequences to kind of punish your child rather than create your own punishments for them. And so, you know, if your child doesn't want to eat what's on the table for dinner, then you say, okay, well, that is your choice. You exercised your choice. You got, you know, you own that choice. And if they're hungry later, that's a natural consequence. You didn't have to punish them or say, you have to eat this or whatever. You have to sit at the table. They made a choice and they will see that consequence. And if they're old enough, you do this obviously within reason. You don't want to starve your child, but mm. um, you'll, they'll find that, oh shoot, like if I don't eat this food, I'm going to be hungry later. And they start to begin to see that their choices have consequences. And I think it's a really great lesson for them to learn, not just with food, but with anything, right? That if you choose something and you find that it's safe within that rate, that bound, that, the, you know, the consequence is safe for them to have, then you let the na- let nature take its course and let nature kind of discipline your child, right? And you don't have mm-hmm. to be the bad guy. I don't, I mean, it's, it's a broad answer. And obviously there's different things you can do. I know some kids, if they see it, they don't want to eat it. So there have been some foods where I'll like chop up carrots and I'll just they'll be minced in with meat or something or in a meatball so they don't see the carrots as much and some people say that's good some people say no they need to see the actual food there's lots of opinions when it comes to food but definitely uh we as in our family we the kids eat what we eat we don't make a second meal for the kids and so you eat it if you don't want it then you'll be hungry and then another rule we have with our kids is that even if they don't like it or think they don't like it they have to at least try it Mm. and be willing to try and you know if they're gagging like how often do I pick stuff out of my food that I don't want to eat as an adult you know Mm. and so kind of giving them grace right (laughs) in the same way that I give myself grace like I don't want to eat green peppers so I don't put them in my food and they might have preference as well but I just want them to at least taste it because you just never know And they're they're willing to do that. At least they know that that's a rule in our home. So just setting that expectation early, I think is also really important. Interesting. And uh, another question that has crossed my mind actually just now was like uh, tablets. 
right? It's, it's a yeah. the new era. Um, it just seems like the kids I see their tablets keep getting tinier and tinier. Now, now I, I think the last time I, I saw like a three year old on, on a tablet. So what's sort of the, you know, trends you've been observing? And how are people sort of dealing with this new issue of kids that can't get off of their screens? It's such a hard topic because schools are in, I mean, school, elementary schools are introducing laptops in the curriculum, right? It's not something we can escape. And um, research shows, at least this is, you know, I've been, I've been graduated for almost 10 years, but research shows that children below two have no need for screen time. They, they're not cognitively developed enough to understand that, you know, just what's going on and, and it can be addictive, et cetera. Um, with that being said, I had my second baby when my first was 18 months, so he wasn't even two yet. And there were times where I was desperate and I would turn on the TV. And so also there's a balance, right? Like if it's going to be you going crazy or your child getting just a little, you getting a little bit of downtime to be a better parent, I think, I think that there's, there's a little bit of leeway there, but they, it is recommended that children or two do not have screen access. I think that if you do choose to have screen access for children two or older, that you find an educational option. And so a lot of ways to make screen time more efficient and effective and educational for your child, they say that you should watch with them and you should talk through scenarios with them. So for example, a great show for kids to watch is like Daniel Tiger. Daniel Tiger is kind of a spinoff of Mr. Rogers for those who aren't familiar because you don't have yeah, to. I've never heard of but, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Daniel Tiger is basically Mr. Rogers in a cartoon form. And mm -hmm. they go through scenarios that children come across every day, like conflict and how, or death or um, differences. You know, like children, there's like an episode where a girl has like crutches or something and they talk about like handicaps and different. It's a really great educational show, but children will just watch and just kind of glaze over. And it's really important that you watch with them and that you talk through stuff. So you say, look at how is he feeling right now and help the child develop, develop and understand and process what's going on. And that kind of screen time is actually really, really great for children when you're sitting by them, but it takes work. Right. And I think a lot of parents just do it more to kind of get their kids out of the way. And obviously there's a time and a place for that. I'm not judging because I've also done it, but to try and be very intentional about screen time, because it's inevitable, your children are going to, and they're having it younger and younger. And so I think being intentional about what they're allowed to watch. I actually just recommended something on my Instagram today. There's a show on Netflix called Number Blocks. And my son, who is five, has learned multiplication and division from this show. And so that's mm -hmm. one that I, you know, guiltlessly can say, you can watch this show. And we are very intentional about, you know, if they want to watch a show, they say, you know, can I watch a show? And I say, you can watch one that's good for your brain. And they have, they know which shows that they're allowed to watch that help them learn math or science or different things like that. And so I think a huge part of it is just being very intentional and recognizing also that a lot of shows, I've seen a lot of parents let their kids watch shows like movies and stuff like Spider-Man or things like that. And they're super fun movies, but we also have to recognize cognitively children up until they're six don't know the difference between reality and fiction and so they'll watch a movie and it's really hard for them to process that that's not real mm. um same with their dreams it's really hard for them to tell if a dream was real or not everything's kind of a reality to them and so you can really scare a child you know if you're watching a show and a lot of children maybe six they're starting to understand but a little bit younger than six they don't understand that there's a bad guy and then there's something that you know an ending where it's happily ever after they don't connect that and so the mm -hmm. fear of this bad guy can linger on past the resolution of the film that they're watching. And so you really do have to be intentional about where is my child's brain at cognitively to be able to process these things. And so that's why we usually try and stick to educational PBS type shows. Um, and my son, that's, he's going to be seven this year. He's getting to a point now where we'll let him watch some, some movies, you know, with bad guys and stuff because he's starting to understand, okay, the bad guy gets caught all as well. Whereas, you know, my three-year-old doesn't quite understand that. So, all right. so you um, were raised in both Japan and the U.S. And I think a lot of parents, especially people who, you know, come from this international school background have to make these big decisions, right? Where do you live? And even more important is, you know, where are your children going to live their formative years? Because that's going to mold 
so much of you know who they become. Off air, you've mentioned how you guys might move to Japan, and how you know up until this point, your your oldest child, right, who's seven years old, has lived all seven years in the states. So you know, what is your perspective in regards to figuring out that balance, you know, and, and what the benefits and the and the drawbacks of living in Japan versus living in the U.S. Yeah, totally. It's hard. I mean, being a third culture kid is just hard, right? I, the question, Darren and I always joke, the question, where are you from? <laughs> it's always like the hardest thing to answer when you've lived all over the place. Darren actually lived in many more countries than I did and never went to school in the United States until he was in college. And mm. so he, Japan is probably his, where he considers the place he lived the long, or he lived there the longest. He was there five years and then he also served a mission in Japan for two years. So his time in Japan is seven years, <clears throat> mine is over 10. And so, you know, we want, we want to go to Japan. Japan is home to us, honestly. Being in the States, we've been in a few different states here and there, but it's only been a couple of years. And so we really feel like Japan is home to us. And so it has been something that has been on our mind. And we've always, since we've been married, since, since before we got married, in fact, that was probably a huge reason why we got married is because we we kind of had a similar vision of what we wanted to do with our future. And I think a huge reason why I married Darren as well is because he was a third culture kid and he understood what my life was like. I've had so many people say, well, where are you from? And if I say Tokyo, they're like, oh, well, your English is really good. Or, well, oh, now I see why you kind of look the way you do or you know, different things like that. And they don't quite grasp that there's this international world right outside of yeah outside of the US. And so Darren and I both have made it a goal to be in Japan. And we actually would love to be there for the next 10 years if possible, even. Mm -hmm. And so we've had some opportunities come up right now, just with COVID, they've kind of curbed it. And so we'll probably revisit it in a year. But we have made very conscious decisions to try and be in very diverse places, just so that our children already are exposed to cultures, multiple different types of cultures from all over the world. And so we, when we graduated, when my husband graduated from BYU, I was working and then we, he got a job. And so we moved and we had a choice of a few different locations. It was with Vanguard and they have a few different main offices. And we chose Charlotte, North Carolina, because we felt like it's a, it's a place we haven't been, right? It's a place that is far away from our family, far away from what we're used to as far as what's in the United States. And it was so great. We met so many different people from so many different cultures and there was a school there that had Japanese immersion that I was planning to put my children in. And mm. I was really excited about it. And then we got this job in New York City uh, almost three years ago. And we moved to New York City, which again, just exposed us to so many different cultures, so many different languages. And so our children are very familiar with bilingual homes. In fact, most of their friends speak another language. And mm. we, it was funny when I walked into their school the school that I wanted them to go to, they have a Japanese dual language program there. And I sought it out and I made sure that I signed my kids up in this program. And when I yeah. went to tour the school, I had my youngest baby in a baby carrier. He was not even quite a year yet. And one of the kids in the school, in the classroom, saw us in the doorway kind of peeking in. He said, look, it's a white baby. <laughs> because the whole school is not, there's not a single white person in this whole school. And even yeah. my kids, I was like, well, he's not technically full white. <laughs> I mean, I know he <laughs> looks really white because my husband's really white. But um, but I just love that. I love that he can be the minority in a group and, and recognize that there's so much more out there. And um, I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to do that because not everybody can just up and say, hey, let's go to a super cultural place, right? It's not mm -hmm. always a, a, something that the luxury that someone has. But luckily with, with Darren's job, we're able to. So we are hoping to make it to Japan in the next five years or so. And when we do so, I'm debating what, what I want to do with my kids. Do I want them in an international school? Do I want them in a local school? Do I want to maybe put them in a public school early on and then switch them to international later? Um, there's a lot of questions there as far as what we want to do, but we definitely feel like we want them to understand that they are Japanese. They're only a quarter, but and they don't necessarily look it, but they are Japanese and that is their culture. And we have family in Japan that I want them to be able to communicate with. They have my mom who also can speak English, but she's, you know, I want them to be able to communicate with her in Japanese. And mm -hmm. so it's definitely something that we have prioritized in our lives. And they're very familiar with the culture. And we, as far as like, I don't know, Japan, Japanese culture, so much of it is food. 
So we de mm -hmm. definitely expose them a lot to Japanese food at home and they are familiar with, with that and, and the school, you know, his, their classes, half, half of the classes, Japanese speaking native speakers. And so he has, my kids have a lot of exposure to it and I'm glad we're in a place that we can do that. It's definitely um, not easy for everybody, but we are lucky to have, you know, be in a city where that is available. So it's, it's funny how you were um, in Japan and then came over to the States at age six. So it sounds like maybe some of your kids are going to be the exact opposite. Well, they'll spend the first six years in the States and then come to Japan. Yeah, definitely. I know we were like, my, a lot of my friends are like, oh, do you just want to go there for a year and a half? And we're like, no year or two or whatever we said no we want to we want to be there like 10 15 years we plan to make japan our home if we can get there <laughs> if we can get there uh we just we also don't want to go just to go right we want to make sure it's a, it's a wise career move for my husband but yeah i i hope they i hope they do i hope that they go and it's they feel it, that it's home in the way that my husband and i do because it's really special place to us so yeah there's just so many options and i, I guess that's a fun thing right there's many doubts and issues and problems yeah as, as you mentioned um very accurately just being a tck is hard right it's it's hard in, in so many ways and it's but i think the rewards are also so much bigger it's definitely interesting to see see what what's going to happen i hope you guys make it to japan thank you yeah we hope so too <laughs> if we do we'll come over to korea and say hi Definitely. <laughs> it's not far. It's not far, especially once COVID is done. So um, yeah. what I like to do at the very end is I like to have the guests sort of just talk for a minute or two or three about what is coming up in the next few years, next few decades, although it's kind of ironic because you just did mention some of it. So basically, <laughs> it, maybe not including what you just said, like minutes ago, yeah. um, what else? Is okay, so the next few years, we're going to have a baby girl here next month. So um, having a girl will be a new adventure. We haven't had girls before <laughs> in our family. Um, but we're really excited about that. I've always wanted to be in the world of the corporate world. I mean, I'm not quite sure what I want to do. Like, obviously, you can tell I'm all over the place with my passions, but I would love to maybe further my education. It, I've talked about furthering and getting a master's in something for a while, but just have found that right now my focus is my children, right? I've got three at home and they will one day be in school and then I won't have to pay for childcare and I can really focus on my personal development as well. So probably in the next decade, I will be pursuing some sort of master's degree, some sort of career um, as my kids are older and in school and things like that. So that's something I'm looking forward to. What I want to do changes every week. <laughs> so I, I take after my mom and my actually my dad as well. My dad always changed his job after a couple of years. So I just have a lot of interest. And so, you know, it goes from like the medical field all the way to business and finance and things like that. So we'll see where I end up. But that is the plan is that we'll get them raised, we'll get them in school, and then mom can have her personal development time to do and pursue something that I'm interested in. So. Awesome. Well, thank you for being the guest for the 23rd episode of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Yeah. And yeah, once you guys live in Japan, um, I'll see you <laughs> somewhere yeah, sometime sure. in your children. For sure. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye. See ya. <laughs>